Well, when we talk about prophecy in any book of prophecy, uh, it's, it's always meant to have an intended purpose. And, uh, and certainly it's got to be more than to satisfy the curious. And, uh, uh, and certainly when we look at prophecy and fulfilled prophecy, it validates for us the inspiration of Scripture. Uh, but it's, it's got to be and should do more than that. The title of the message is, Why Should We Study John's, John's Prophecy? And I can illustrate that as I've done in the past. Just a, a simple story happened to me a few years ago as I would drive uh, from our house in Kaneohe up and over Mokapu. As you, as you come to the top and start to drop down into Kaneohe, if you drive that on a regular basis like, uh, like I do, uh, I, as I hit the top of the hill, I'm always looking at the bottom of the hill uh, for uh, the employees of the mayor down there doing some fundraising at the bottom because it's, it's two lane, it's divided, you know, it drops to a 25 very quickly, otherwise known as a speed trap. And um, so with, uh, I'm kind of used to that. And one day I'm driving up the hill and there's a guy at the top of the hill weed whacking, one of the guys on the side of the road. Just as I start approaching, he stops weed whacking and he goes like this. <laughs> I knew exactly what he meant. <laughs> uh, he was telling me to slow down, which I did. And as I came across the crest of the hill, now with a new vantage point, I could see the fundraising activities at the bottom of the hill. <laughs> and I was really glad that I had heeded his warning. See, he had a vantage point that I did not have. In a sense, from the top of that hill, he could look into my future <laughs> and tell me what was coming ahead. And it changed my behavior. Uh, and that's one of the things that prophecy is meant to do. God has a different vantage point. He can look ahead into the future and tell us what is coming up next. The idea was, is that he doesn't do that to satisfy our curiosity, but to change our behavior and our perspective on life. And I had a, a greater appreciation for those guys that weed back on the side of the road as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, God bless you. And uh, the one that gives us this perspective, that's the other thing. It's meant to give us a great appreciation for, for who he is as, uh, as well. Uh, John is the, is the author, the undisputed author of the book of Revelation. And um, he is writing in the, uh, the mid-90s uh, mid AD, about 95, 96 uh, AD, the church is living under tremendous persecution. Domitian is the, uh, the emperor. He was one of the few emperors that actually unleashed, like Nero, a, an empire-wide persecution against the church. It didn't happen all the time. It had a tendency to happen in pockets here or there, but there were a few emperors that were very evil and very bad, and, and this guy is one of them, and he's reigning during the time of John writing this. So he's writing. He's going to write to seven churches in uh, Asia Minor, and this is meant to encourage them that uh, it's difficult. You're suffering. Yeah, your, your family members are being martyred for their faith. They're being thrown to the lions. They're being hauled off to Rome, thrown into the circus and devoured by wild animals for the sheer entertainment purpose of the drunken crowds in, uh, in Rome. But uh, God re reveals to John, again, a revelation of himself to encourage them to hang on no matter what the circumstances might look like. Uh, there on earth. Now, in terms of the, the timing, he reigns from 81 to 96. Uh, and it is believed then, uh, historically, a very good historical accounts that uh, at 96, when he no longer is on the throne and Trajan, Emperor Trajan takes over, that John then is released from the Isle of Patmos. And it was no club med. It was a, it was a criminal institution there. Uh, and he is able to return to Ephesus where he continues to minister and pastor, where he dies and his grave is there in Ephesus to this day, along with Mary, the mother of Jesus, who remembered Jesus from the cross, entrusting the care of his mother to John. And, and uh, in the end, prior to his, his uh, imprisonment and, uh, and afterwards, he is able to, to carry that out. So that's kind of the historical setting. There's basically three views of looking at, uh, at prophecy in the book of Revelation in particular. Um, I'll give you the two incorrect and then the correct. Uh, one is the allegorical view that's developed during about the fourth century. And that is simply to say uh, everything is an allegory in that it says this, but it really means this. 
Uh, and that allegorical view of prophecy is, is what caused prophecy to never be studied. Then through the Roman Catholic Church, what we call the, the Reformation Church, uh, and, uh, and so forth. And, uh, uh, and obviously there are, and we'll talk about the symbolism in the book, but um, the best we can, obviously we always want to take Scripture at, uh, at face value. Uh, the other view is the historical view, and that is the view of a lot of the reformers and, uh, and guys like Hank Hattegraaff uh, that would uh, say that the events of the book of Revelation took place during the Roman, uh, the Roman Empire. They would take the dating of the, the book of Revelation from about 95 AD, and they would push it forward to, uh, the, again, the mid-5th or 6th, uh, excuse me, the 40s or the 50s, uh, which there's no evidence for that, and there's tremendous evidence uh, for the, uh, the later dating. Uh, and they would push it forward so that they could say that uh, all the events of the book of Revelation actually took place. And of course, the, the, uh, uh, the emperor, one of the emperors, whether it's Nero at the time, that he is the Antichrist and so forth. And so, again, they have to wrestle the text out of its context to be able to make it uh, uh, express that particular view. And I uh, have a very interesting uh, debate uh, on, on, on DVD of of Mark Hitchcock debating Hank Canegraaff. Mark Hitchcock wrote his PhD thesis on the dating of the book of Revelation. And, um, and it was uh, uh, very overwhelming, the evidence that he was able to, uh, to present. So again, but historically, uh, Christians around the world are going to choose a, an allegorical view. It's just an analogy. This is really not going to happen. Uh, or it's a historical view, it has already happened. Uh, and of course, then there is the, the literal view uh, that says from chapter 4, verse 1 on is still yet, yet future. And, um, and again, uh, you know, we place the rapture taking place before chapter 4. Uh, we see the millennial reign of Jesus Christ is not symbolic, but a literal reign and, uh, and so forth. And uh, Sometimes we say when the, uh, when the Bible makes sense, seek no further sense. You know, just take it at, as, it's, as literally as you possibly can. Now, we're going to talk about metaphors and symbolic language in just, just a moment because the, the book is full of those. But those are the, those are the three uh, views that uh, Christians have held historically. Let's read the, the first three verses. Uh, John begins the revelation of Jesus Christ which, Christ, which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ to all things that he saw. Blessed is he who reads and those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. What an introduction. <laughs> You can hear that with a little music in the background and a real deep voice, for the time is near, you know. Uh, and it was what these guys were seeing, uh, and certainly uh, uh, I believe it's close for us. Uh, I want to go on and read verse 19, because there we have the outline of the book, and we'll use this to overview the book as we go through the message here. Verse 19 continues, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. So there's the, uh, the outline of the book. We'll talk more about that in a moment. But the first thing we want to mention that there are specific purposes in the prophecy in verse 1 says it's the revelation of, uh, of Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the book of Revelation is not in a sense to tell us what happens in the future during the tribulation period, or, although it does that. The purpose of the book, at least one of the main purposes, is to reveal to us Jesus Christ in his glory. Uh, the word the does not appear in the Greek text. It's a, a revelation of Jesus Christ because it's not the only one. We know about Jesus through the four Gospels. We know much about him, what is written in the epistles. Uh, we know more about him in terms of pictures and shadows and types of the Old Testament. But this is a revelation of Jesus Christ. And it's a very important one because it is the revelation of Jesus Christ in his glorified state in heaven. You know, I've, uh, I've mentioned it before. It's quite a departure to think of him being the suffering servant. 
of, uh, of the Gospels, uh, the hippie-looking guy walking around in his robe and sandals versus the glorified Savior that is now in heaven, uh, who is, we'll see, is referred to as the Lord of Lords and the Kings of Kings. Uh, now, the word revelation just simply means the unveiling. In the Greek, it's uh, a- a- apocalypse. And we think of that word as, as being, you know, sometimes being uh, uh, tragic or horrific or, you know, uh, you know ending times, terrible things. That, but it actually just means the, uh, the unveiling. So in a sense, the Holy Spirit pulls back the curtain of the time-space continuum, allows John to see into heaven, which allows him to be spoken to by God to see the future, but his glimpses into heaven end up revealing a, a really a different look at Jesus Christ. And, and if we don't get anything else out of the book, we are to get out of it a different picture of, uh, of Jesus Christ uh, as, we, as we study. <clears throat> There's a <clears throat> thing people say that the book of Revelation is, is a sealed book and that we really can't uh, understand it. Well, that's refuted in the first verse. It's an unveiling. Now, remember when we studied uh, <coughs> Daniel's gospel, uh, <coughs> at the end, of, it says uh, to shut up the words and seal the book in Daniel 12, 4. It was a sealed book for a future time. Now that Jesus Christ has come, uh, now that he's, he died and he rose again, now that we have the gospels and the epistles, and now that we have the book of Revelation, Daniel's book is no longer a sealed book. It makes perfectly good sense to us, and it fits like this with the book of Revelation. And, uh, and sometimes in Bible colleges, uh, <clears throat> as it was the case with, uh, with me, you, you actually study Daniel and Revelation together in the same semester. They, they like you to do that because they fit together so, so closely. Daniel was a sealed book. It no longer is. The book of Revelation, it was never meant to be a sealed book. It starts out at the beginning saying, we're unveiling this. We're, we're going to tell you something that you didn't know. And part of what we're going to tell you is something about Jesus Christ that maybe you've not seen or not comprehended uh, before. <clears throat> the second thing in the book is the purpose is to re- reveal Jesus Christ and his eternal plan. And again, throughout the book, the central character will be uh, Jesus Christ. In Revelation 1 to 3, Christ is seen as the exalted priest, king, ministering to the churches. In Revelation 4 to 5, he is seen in heaven as the glorified Lamb of God, reigning on the throne. In Revelation 6 to 18, Christ is the judge of all the earth. In Revelation 19, he returns to earth as the, as the conquering king. Got a little chart here that I got from Warren Wordsby, if that's in the next slide. Again, the author is, is John. In his gospel, the emphasis was believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. In his epistle, be sure of your salvation. If you read 1 John, he'll tell you how you can be sure of your salvation. Revelation, it's all about be ready. When is a life received? When is a life revealed? Revelation, a life rewarded. Uh, one is about salvation. One is about sanctification. One is about the sovereignty of, uh, of God's rule. Jesus is presented as the prophet, the priest, uh, and, and the king. So we'll make more references to John and his authorship here, uh, here in a moment. But uh, the third thing in the purpose, the purpose is to re- reveal Jesus Christ in his titles. Uh, the Lamb of God is used uh, 28 times. We mentioned this, I think, last week, but I think most things in heaven will constantly remind us of what Jesus Christ has done for us in terms of purchasing our our salvation. And one of them is the predominant title used of Jesus Christ is that of the uh, the Lamb of God. Uh, John says in in Revelation 5, 9, in regards to one of the seals, he says, but you are worthy to open the seal because you were slain and with your blood you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Certainly what the focus is upon Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who died for us. When you and I are in heaven, we will hear often, apparently, and make reference to Jesus often as the Lamb of God. And it will constantly be a reminder to us that he died for our sins. Look at verse 5, some of the titles. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn among the dead, and the ruler of the kings of, of the earth. Look at verse 8. 
I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Uh, down in verse 17, John says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, Do not be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I'm the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Revelation 3, verse 14. These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. The whole book is full of these titles of, uh, of Jesus Christ. Very interesting that, that one of his names is the Amen. Now, we say Amen because we mean we agree with. In our vernacular, we might say right on or some other term. Probably don't use that anymore. If you're an old guy, you might say that. But uh, nonetheless, it's the idea. Amen means somebody has said something, prayed something, and we agree with it. Amen. In a sense, Jesus, one of his titles is the Amen. He's the last word. <laughs> if you don't agree with him, you've got you to gotta change your mind. Uh, because again, he is the faithful and, and true witness. He is the Amen. Uh, verse uh, 5 of chapter 5, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See the line of the tribe of Judah. The root of David is triumph. He is able to open the seal, uh, the scroll, and its seven seals. Again, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root uh, of David. One more, and, and maybe the, what some would consider the key to the whole book, and that's in Revelation 19.16. Uh, one of the titles there. And, and you'll notice when it comes up, it's very different in your, in your English text. Uh, because it, it says, let me read it and we'll talk about it. It says, on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. And then notice it's, it's indented and it's all in capital letters. King of kings and Lord of lords. And I want to tell you that there are 95 Greek manuscripts of the book of Revelation that we have. As well as other many more and translated to other languages and, uh, and so forth. But we've got 95 prior to the idea of, of the printing press. In every one of those Greek manuscripts, when it comes to chapter 19, verse 16, you know, and they use a Greek term, but it super capitalizes King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and it indents it in every one of them. You're reading a Greek manuscript, of the book of Revelation, it's like you're reading along and just glancing, and it's like, wow, what's that? And it just jumps off. Every one of them is exactly the same. I think it's important to note that this wasn't something that the translators of an English version thought, let's emphasize this. It was emphasized right from the beginning. That's why some would hold, this is the key verse. What is the book of Revelation about? Jesus is the King of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. Now, again, we're going to learn about all things that are going to happen in the future and so forth, but really it's the revelation, the unveiling of Jesus Christ in a way that maybe we have not seen him uh, before. The fourth thing, the purpose is to reveal Jesus Christ in his glorious return to planet earth. We see that right away in verse 7. Behold, he is coming with clouds, and every eye will see him, and they, will, they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth were mourned because of him. Even so, amen. Now again, this is his return to planet earth. It's not the rapture of the church. And the rapture of the church, Jesus Christ does not return to planet earth. He returns in the clouds to meet the, uh, the church uh, in the air. We are caught away. He comes as, as a thief in the night. When he returns in chapter 19 uh, for uh, coming back to planet earth, he comes not for the church, but he comes with the church. It's not secret. It's public. Every eye will see him. Everyone will know he's coming. It's dramatically two different uh, events. So there are some very specific purposes uh, in the prophecy. Secondly, just to look at the, uh, the process God used to give us the prophecy. And, and certainly that involved what John saw and heard, as he says, as a revelation from God. And God uses many, uh, many vehicles. Uh, there's an angel of the Lord that, that gives the revelation to John on, on many occasions. Uh, there are other times when it's Jesus Christ personally that's speaking to John. Uh, there are other times when he hears a, a voice from heaven. There are other times when he makes reference to it's God uh, the Father. But then when, you get, uh, when we get to chapter 2, 
And we have the message to the churches. He's, he says, let him who has an ear hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So you have God the Father glorifying Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit speaking to John. You've got Jesus speaking to him, an angel as a, as a messenger, as well as even and an elder says to him from heaven. So it's revealed in, in all these different ways, but obviously God is behind it all. Not to even uh, belabor that, but angels play a, predom a predominant role in the book. We'll see, we'll see many angels. And we'll see them active in worship, in worship of, uh, of Jesus Christ. So again, the book came uh, from God to John. No matter what the various means to communicate it, it was, uh, it was all from, from God. Secondly, the process involved what John saw and heard as a testimony. And uh, uh, these are words is that he used in the gospel and his epistle. He's very um, emphatic about, this is what I saw, this is what I heard, I bear testimony, this is my word, I'm a faithful and true witness, and so forth. Back in uh, John's gospel in John 19, 35, it says, and he who has been, uh, who has seen has testified, and his testimony is true, and he knows that he is telling the truth so that you may believe. John's gospel, hey, I'm giving you my testimony, this is what I've seen, this is what I've heard uh, and I'm, I'm giving you the truth. Very emphatic about that. In his epistle, John says this about his testimony in 1 John 1.1. 1, 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested, and we have seen him, and bear witness, and declare to you that eternal life, which was with the Father, was manifested to us. Again, John's poetical terms, speaking of Jesus, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write to you that your joy may be full. He's going to describe uh, again his intimate relationship with Jesus Christ so that our joy may be full. And then down in 1 John 4, 14, he says, and we have seen and testified that the Father has sent the Son as Savior of the world. So John's very emphatic about what he's doing. And he's done that in all of his writings. I'm here to give testimony, Gospel of John. He is our Savior. First John, I'm here to give testimony because we know him intimately. You can know him intimately. Be secure in that, that your joy may be full. Now he bears testimony once again for the last time as he reveals to us Jesus Christ in a way that uh, we have not seen him before. Uh, the third thing about the process, it involves the use of, of symbolism, as I mentioned. Now, in verse 1, it says, And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. The word signify is important. It means to show by a sign. And, um, and John uses symbolism throughout, and this, this requires a, a little bit of discussion. And... Uh, I don't see Tricia Casasa, our in-house English teacher here, to back me up on this, but uh, you'll have to take my word for uh, some of the grammar here as we go through this. But in terms of why symbolism, and of course this is uh, speculation, we could certainly say because God made it that way. That's the answer you tell all your kids for the answers you're not sure about, because God said so. God made it that way. That's why the butterflies do this. That's why that happens. But uh, in terms of uh, some perspective anyway, for one thing, practically, it was seen as a spiritual code understood only by those who knew Christ personally. Again, the church is under tremendous persecution. It's talking primarily about the revealed Jesus Christ, who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords, who will rule and set up his kingdom over all the earth. Would not go over real big with the emperor. And so in a sense, there's symbolism used. It may have been used simply as a code that would be certainly understood by Christians, but not by the non-Christian. Uh, the second thing, and I think this is uh, interesting, and uh, perhaps you'll agree, that symbolism is not weakened by time. Uh, it's not weakened by time. Uh, John's able to draw on great images uh, and, uh, and use them to encourage the persecuted and suffering saints. And, um, but again, symbolism, but indicating real events that will take place. And I, I think that's why men like C.S. Lewis and other are able to take some of the symbolism from the book of Revelation and translate it uh, into uh, books like 
uh, like he has done uh, and convey the same tremendous messages if we understand that Jesus Christ is, is the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's, that's quite an image, you know, that is not weakened by time. You know, it's not like the, the nature of lions have changed over the last 2,000 years. I think lions are still pretty fearsome and, uh, and, and so forth. And so there's imagery that is used that is not weakened by time. And the third thing is symbolism not only conveys information, but it imparts values and arouses emotions. He could have talked about the, the Antichrist being the dictator of the world, but instead he talks about the Antichrist being the beast. That, that conveys a lot, a lot more. Uh, he could have talked about uh, uh, Babylon and so forth. But he refers to not just Babylon the great or a great city or a defiled city. He says Babylon who's like a harlot. So he uses symbolism and language that is meant to convey. And I think that it does um, much more than, than he, he not used those kinds of terms. And again, biblical symbolism is consistent with the whole Bible in its revelation. Some symbols are explained for us in the text. Some are understood because of what we know in the Old Testament. There are at least 300 direct references to the Old Testament in the book. There's probably 500 or more references or alluding to text in the Old Testament. That's why we said if we're going to study the book of Revelation, we have to go, we have to go uh, back to the future. We have to be able to understand what is said in the past and get that symbolism if we're going to be able to relate to what John is saying in the future. He's writing to a group of people with the assumption that they understand and have a working knowledge of, of the Old Testament, and so uh, we need that as well. And there's, there's just some symbolism that we speculate. We do, we're not really sure what he meant when he uses it. So uh, herein lies a little bit of the, the problem and, and disagreement. When it's a direct reference to an Old Testament reference, we know exactly what he's talking about. When it's not, it's like you're, you're going to get differing opinions as to what that symbolism uh, actually means. How do we know when he uses symbolism? Well, he uses words like like 22 times. And it's not a bad idea if you've got a Bible and you don't mind marking it up or you want to get another Bible for this study to mark up to take a yellow pen or an underliner or something. And every time you hit the word like, you underline it because that means it's symbolic. It's not saying it is this, it's like this. John is seeing things way, way, way into the future. And what he's seeing, he, he can't always comprehend. And he's trying to figure out some way of communicating what he's seeing. So he says, it's, it's like chicken. What does it taste like? It's like chicken, you know? <laughs> Well, I don't know if I want to taste it or not. Well, I know you haven't tasted it before. It's like chicken. Well, John is going to use that phrase. It's, it's not really this, but it's like this over and over again. It's a simile. So those are easier to pick up. 22 times he uses that. Uh, uh, verse 16 of chapter 1. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. What was his countenance like? Man, I don't know, but it was radical. It was like the sun shining at full strength. I, I can't even describe it to you. So he uses symbolic language. He uses the word as 65 times. Again, a simile. Uh, it means uh, similar in action or substance or quality. Like in verse 10 of chapter 1, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. It wasn't a guy playing a trumpet. It was the voice. It was so loud. It was so distinctive. It's, it's as the trumpet was playing behind me. That's the best I can do to describe it, is, uh, is the idea. So there's very clear-cut times when he uses a, a simile. Now, John also uses a, a metaphor. Now, a metaphor, again, is, is saying it's like something, but the word like or as is not used. That's what makes it... Uh, uh, a metaphor. And again, if Mrs. Kosasa was here, she could back me up on, uh, on that. So here's the problem. By definition, because a metaphor does not include a word like or as, how do we know when it's a metaphor and when we should take it literally? Well, again, that's when, uh, when 
common sense makes sense, seek no, no further sense. Uh, Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth. That's a metaphor, right? He, you know, when it says, uh, and Jesus is the door, he's not literally a door. It's, it's a metaphor. You are a city set on a hill. He's trying to describe something. It's a metaphor. <laughs> we're, we're not literally supposed to go climb a mountain, build a city on top of a, a, a hill somewhere and shine our flashlights or our cell phones at night or something. Uh, it's just, it's simply a metaphor. So when when a passage makes common sense, don't seek any further sense. A metaphor is simply a metaphor. But you can understand why there's extensive symbolic language used. Sometimes the simile, the word as, the word like, makes it really clear. When it's a metaphor, it should be pretty obvious in terms of common sense. But you can understand why those that chose to, chose to interpret this as a giant allegory. Because again, if you don't have a working knowledge of the Old Testament... Uh, then none of those references, 500 plus, are going to make sense to you. Uh, and if you don't see it and accept the Bible literally, then you're going to try to interpret and you misinterpret much of what is said in the book. And then they therefore conclude, well, it must be a sealed book. But it's not a sealed book. It's the unveiling of, of Jesus Christ. So there's specific purposes in the prophecy. There's a process God used. And then there's uh, parts or divisions of the prophecy that help us understand the meaning. And that's why I read uh, verse 19. Uh, note again, write these things which you've seen, the things which are, and the things that you know, will take place uh, in the future. Now, the, um, again, verse 19 tells us how the book is divided and outlined. The word hereafter or after this is a Greek term, uh, metatauta. Uh, after this. And, and therefore, when we get to chapter 4, verse 1, and then it uses metatauta again after this, okay, this is, now we're into this part. Uh, chapter 1, John, write about what, what you already know in the past. Now, chapter 2 to 3, what's happening right now in terms of the churches and what's going on. Exhortations as, as, as well as commendations that take place in chapter 2 and 3 in regards to the churches there, but the churches as a whole. And then chapter 4, uh, write about what's going to be taking place uh, uh, in, in the future. So again, the first part, what he's seen in the past. 3B, the second part, what John is currently experiencing. And then 3, the third part will take place in the, uh, in the future. Uh, go ahead and, and uh, pop up the next slide, and uh, Kathy, and then you're going to have to uh, let your fingers do the walking. There's like 52 clicks in this whole thing, so start clicking, and I'll tell you when to stop. There's a little timeline. It begins with the, the death and resurrection of Jesus and what we call the church age. You can keep going. A couple more. Yeah, and again, there's, a tr there's uh, the first part, chapter 1, uh, verse 9 to verse 20, what thou hast seen, what's in the past. Okay, and that's uh, the next section. The things which are, which are going to take us right up to chapter 4. So that's how the book is outlined. And somewhere in there, in the church age, you can't read that, but that's when the rapture of the church occurs. And then go on to the next one. And the things that will be here after. So within the scroll of the book, you really have another scroll that begins with the seven seals, judgments, chapter 6 to 8. And then uh, the seven trumpet judgments, uh, 8, 7 to 11, 9. And then the seven key figures, uh, 12 to 13. Uh, and, uh, and then uh, after that, we've got the seven bowl judgments. A lot of sevens. The seven dooms of Babylon. And then uh, 19, the return of Jesus Christ. 20, the millennial reign of Christ. A little throne there. You can go ahead and click the rest of them until it uh, comes on up. And the thousand-year reign of Christ and so forth. So uh, one of the things you'll notice, there's a lot of sevens. <laughs> there's seven Beatitudes. We just read one. Blessed is he who reads, and it means to read out loud, this book, and those who hear it and do it. That's a Beatitude. And there's seven. Uh, there, there are seven seal judgments, seven trumpets, seven key figures, seven bold judgments, seven dooms over Babylon, uh, uh, and, uh, and many more sevens. Again, biblically, the number seven is the number of perfection or fulfillment. And the fulfillment of all these things uh, 
are going to be very important for us to, uh, to look at, and that number is used for a, a purpose to see that there's a completion that's taking place in, in all of these, and it's all leading to the return of Jesus Christ to, to planet Earth. Uh, number four is there's a personal agenda in studying the prophecy, and uh, as I mentioned, we will be personally blessed. Uh, uh, when the book was originally sent, again, it was to seven literal churches in Asia Minor. There were many other churches. We've studied about them, church in Colossae, you know, church in uh, other areas in Asia Minor, but it's sent to seven churches. Uh, the reason for that, I think, again, that number seven, it's meant for all believers. Now, they were supposed to get this as a book and circulate it uh, among them. So when we get to the seven different messages, it's not that... Well, this church only had this problem, this church only had this problem, this church only had that problem. We would say the churches in the first century all did some things wrong and all did some things right. And that continues to, uh, to this uh, very day. But notice in chapter 2, verse 7, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Always plural. Obviously, John is writing, and it's much more than to a message, the church at Ephesus or Smyrna. It's always plural. This is a, a revelation for all believers, I think, for, uh, for all time. But uh, we'll be personally blessed. Now, it says uh, those who read it, and as I said, in a Greek tense, it means to read out loud. So now we're going to read it out no, we won't. But the, I can say I've been in services where that's done because it says if you do this and you read it out loud, of course, then if you hear it and do it, then you're, you're personally going to be blessed. It's interesting. It's the only, the only book of the Bible that actually gives that, uh, that promise. But uh, through the course of time, if, uh, if the Lord delays his coming and we make it through the end of the book, which I don't know if we will, uh, but if he does... Uh, then we'll have the blessing of having read it together uh, out loud here on, on Sunday mornings. Secondly, we'll, we personally will realize that the, the time is, is near. Again, John's writing in about 96 AD, and we could say, well, he's saying the time is near then, and it's been almost 2,000 years since then. And, uh, and I would just remind you a couple things. Uh, Peter says, in the last days, there'll be scoffers who will come and they will say, where is the promise of his coming? For since our fathers have fallen asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning. But uh, again, Peter goes on and says, when you hear those scoffers, uh, remember this. God is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness, but he is faithful to us. And he tells us why. If there's been a delay for 2,000 years, it's for this reason. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, anybody here really glad the Lord didn't come back 10 years ago, 5 years ago, 15 years ago? Uh, you know, as much as, you know, at the end, you know, John finishes by saying, come Lord Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, come. Uh, and we pray that. We talked about the uh, the crowns Wednesday night. There are different crowns for a reward, and one of those is a uh, a crown, a special crown that you'll be given in heaven from Jesus Christ if you love his appearing. That's one of the crowns that will, will be given. And certainly to love his appearing means to live as though Jesus Christ could come for you and come for the church uh, at, uh, at any moment. But again, Peter also reminds us that a, a, day, a thousand years to us is like a, a day to the Lord and, uh, and if they were living and looking for their soon return of Jesus Christ in the first century, certainly we should be living and, and looking today with all the prophetic signs that we have uh, around us. Again, when the, when the guy on the side of the road started doing this, you know, I could have had a lot of reactions. I could have driven by and went, what's up with that, man? You know, and then got a, got a ticket. I had to actually really kind of comprehend and understand what what he was saying. I had to have the realization that on this road, sometimes there are police officers with radar, radar guns at the bottom. I kind of had to have that in my mind and that basic understanding. I wasn't a tourist looking lost, looking for the North Shore. You know, I don't think they would have got what that guy was saying, but I drove that road all the time. As soon as he did that, I knew exactly, exactly what he meant. And as a result, it's uh, it changed my, my behavior. 
I could have said, well, I don't really believe him. Maybe this is a practical joke. I could have reacted a lot of different ways to what he was telling me was coming in the future, literally down the road. And, uh, but I didn't. I, I believed what he said, and I, and I, I basically changed my, my perspective of what I was doing. I immediately looked at, uh, at my... Uh, uh, there's a thing in the middle. I'm not exactly what it's sure, and it's got this needle that goes like this, but... Uh, uh, I think it tells you how fast you're going. I'm not sure about that, but I think that's what that's there for. But I immediately focused on that. It made me rethink what I was doing, my priorities, and so forth. And I changed uh, my behavior and my perspective because I believed what that guy was saying was going to happen in the future. Uh, and that's what we want to come to the book of Revelation. I know you're saying, yeah, but could you speed it up a little bit? We only just covered three verses. But... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I think background is uh, important if we're going to under, understand the, the book and what he has to say. Because again, the primary focus is not what's going to happen in the future, although we're going to find that out. The primary focus is Jesus Christ. Uh, and if we, if we change our, our view of, of who he was, I'd encourage you to read through some of those titles. The key verse. What is the book about? It's unveiling Jesus Christ because he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. Uh, I read a little quote. I'll, I, I won't get it exactly right, but it was, it was this idea. I came across it this week. If, if, you, if you were in a battle and it appeared that you were losing the whole time in a battle, but you won in the end, you know, would, you, would you rather have that? Or would you rather be in a battle where it appears that you're triumphing all along and then you lose right at the end? Which, which of those two scenarios would you want? Because as Christians today in this world, we can fight along and do the best we can to represent Jesus Christ and advance the kingdom of God. And at times, it can appear as though we're losing. But guess what? We win in the end. I think we'd much rather have that, that scenario than to, than to maybe have an easier, an ease of life and appear that oh, we're victorious and everybody's coming, becoming Christians and nobody resists us, nobody hassles us. Uh, and, but then in the end, we, we lose everything. I think we want the, uh, the first scenario. And the book of Revelation helps remind us we win. <laughs> we win in the end. Uh, the original readers in the first century that we always have to get into their, their sandals, if we're going to get the correct uh, meaning of this, is that they were suffering, they were being persecuted, they were being martyred for their faith, and this book is supposed to mean something to them. What it means to them is that Jesus Christ, despite what's going on circumstantially, he is the king of kings, he is the lord of lords, and he returns, he sets up his kingdom, and we're with him, and we win. That's, that's the emphasis of the book. Now, I, I hope that we'll understand the days that we're living in because of the future that is laid out in the passage that we'll study, that's not the emphasis of the book. The emphasis of the book is that we'll get a different picture of Jesus Christ and we'll be changed. And of course, I think that's the intent, so that's my, my prayer as well. One, <clears throat> to end with one Warren uh, Wiersbe quote, he says, No believer should study prophecy merely to satisfy his curiosity. When Daniel and John received God's revelations of the future, both fell down as dead men. They were overwhelmed. We need to approach this book as wonders and worshipers, not as academic students. Amen. Amen.